So today we're going to continue our discourse on relativity. This is kind of a big subject, and since I'm on a bit of a roll here, I thought I would just keep it going. And so, uh, but I just wanted to remind you in the last video, um, I made a mistake. Okay, in the last video, I made a mistake and I put a square root in the non relativistic Doppler shift um, when it should, there should not be a square root. And in fact, it should be written like this. Um, but I just want to show you, let's see if I can find it here. I'm just going to show you how, you know, how that happened and also teach you a little bit, bit about latex um, at the same time. And so what I did was to, to write that equation down or to write that formula down, I started from the relativistic equation. Now this is um, gamma, this would be called gamma, which is one over the alpha factor. So this is the gamma factor, the standard way of, <coughs> of writing the relativistic equation. Okay, and so what I did was I got rid of the square, and what I didn't do was I got, didn't get rid of the square root. Okay, so that is that's how that mistake happened, and I correct I'm correcting it now. Uh, I don't want to have to redo the other video because it's already up there and people have already viewed it, and so um, so this is the correct formula for the non-relativistic Doppler shift. And um, this is, uh, I rewrote the specification, I tidied it up a bit, and actually I put the one plus or minus V over C into my specification. Uh, I took out the one over, and I will explain later why I did that. I really, I'm really just doing this to be neat and tidy. When you're doing, um, when you're doing relativistic Doppler shift, um, you use, one over this um, formula here, one over um, what I'm calling alpha Doppler. So now I've got two. Um, I've got two things in my specification. I've got alpha Doppler, which is one plus or minus v over c, and I've got alpha relativity, which is the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. So you can see when it's, this is the first order correction and this is a second order correction. And when you're doing the both Doppler and relativity, this would be an object moving away from you or an object moving towards you. Then you can use the c plus v, c minus v, square root of, or c minus v, c plus v, square root of, to get the relativistic Doppler shift. So this would be alpha relativity, divide, alpha factor relativity divided by alpha factor uh, Doppler. So that divided by that. And so um, this is a nice, neat and tidy way of, of doing this. And so that is why I'm writing it like this in my specification. So also in the last video, I replaced uh, these two factors with this factor, with the, um, with the caveat that it may not accommodate all situations. And it turns out that this does not accommodate all situations. What this does accommodate is the situation where something, an object is moving away from me or an object is moving towards me. Now that would be uh, considered a longitudinal motion. So when something is moving exactly towards me or something is moving exactly away from me, that would be a longitudinal motion. This equation does not account for uh, any transverse motion. So this would be analogous to say a, a car driving by. Okay, when a car is driving past me, for some period of time it is getting closer to me and for another period of time it is moving away from me. When a car is moving towards me, I hear a, a Doppler shift, uh, an increase in pitch, an increase in frequency, which is a blue shift in light. And when the car is moving away from me, I hear a decrease in frequency, which would be analogous to a red shift in, in light theory. So this equation does not account for transverse motions. But today I want to focus on one situation, which is uh, relativ relativity with no Doppler effect. And so when you have the situation where you have um, an object in the middle 
um, with another object in circular motion around that object, then, um, then we need to apply relativity, but no Doppler effect. And the reason for this is because um, the object on the outside here is not getting closer to or further away from the uh, object in the middle. And so you can either, you can have the light source in the middle and the observer or absorber or detector on the outside, or you can have the observer, absorber, detector on the inside and the light source moving in circular motion on the outside. So technically, technically um, there is no longitudinal motion towards or away from the thing in the middle. There's only transverse motion um, relative to the guy in the middle uh, because um, basically what you do is you take the tangential velocity, you plug the tangential velocity of uh, this object in motion into the relativistic equation. And so when an object is in circular motion around another object, then you use relativity with no Doppler effect. And so uh, in a previous video, I said that um, you know, that I replace this uh, and this with this, with the C plus V and C minus V. Uh, but this only works when you have an object moving towards you or away from you in a longitudinal fashion. And so uh, I, I suspected that there were some cases, or I surmise that there are some cases where this wouldn't work. And in fact, uh, this is a case where, um, in this case where you have an object in circular motion around another object, there is no standard Doppler effect, there is only relativity. And so um, I'm, what it, this uh, actually um, should give us some insights into some of the misconceptions and um, uh, alleged paradoxes in, in relativity. Uh, I can tell you there is no paradox and um, at least in this situation, there is no paradox. And so uh, this situation is, is easy enough to analyze and you'll see that there is no paradox. So let's have a closer look at this. Okay, these images I got from Wikipedia from their relativistic um, Doppler shift um, webpage. And so that's where I got these images from. And so on the right here, we have um, an observer, an absorber or a detector, if you want to call it that, in the middle. And we have a, a light source of some kind um, in circular motion around a, um, a non-moving um, object, okay? A non-moving person or detector or uh, whatever it is that is trying to um, see this light. So when you have uh, a non-moving observer and uh, a light source moving around the non in circular motion around the observer, uh, you use this equation here. So the um, frequency that this person sees is the origin is the frequency that this guy is emitting times the alpha factor. Okay, and what this is going to do is this is going to, because um, this, because the um, emitter is the thing that is in motion, it is going to experience clock retardation. Okay, this guy is going to experience clock retardation. And so, uh, so the uh, observer is going to see a red shift. It's going to see a red shift. Okay, so um, when... You're, when the observer is seeing a red shift, you use this equation. If you want to calculate what that shift is, you use this equation here. So over here, we have the reverse situation where we have the observer is now the thing that is moving. Okay, the observer is moving and the light source is in the middle. Okay, the observer, when the observer is moving and the light source is in the middle, then what you have to do is you have to, um, instead of multiplying by the alpha factor, you have to divide by the alpha factor. So you take the frequency that's emitted, divide it by the alpha factor, and that is the um, factor that um, the observer 
is going to see. It's going to think, it's going to see a blue shift. Now, this is the situation that's a little harder to understand. This one's easy to understand because the you know light source is being clock retardated, it's experiencing clock retardation, and so its frequency is going to slow down relative to this guy that is not experiencing clock retardation. So in this case, um, the observer is experiencing clock retardation, and this is not experiencing clock retardation. So this um, observer here is going to, the detector is going to think that the light is blue shifted. Okay, it's going to see um, a higher frequency. It's going to see a higher frequency. So um, this one's a little harder to sort of visualize and, and, and understand, but this is in fact the way it is. And there are many experiments that have been done to show, um, to show this, okay? And so um, we can have a look at that a little bit later. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go through the, the four possibilities of this uh, scenario, there are four possibilities. And um, so I, I made a little table here. Okay, we have an emitter. Okay, we have an emitter, a light source. We have an absorber. Okay, this would be a detector, an, or you can call it an observer, observer or an absorber, whatever you like. Okay, uh, regardless, this is the detector. And you have the perspective. Okay, but I, what I mean by perspective is who is looking at what? Okay, who, who really wants to know what the frequency is that they're looking at? Okay, so we, we have um, the emitter can be moving. Okay, we, in the, so the very first one, so we have uh, the emitter can be moving or it can be still. So it can be moving or it can be in the middle and not moving. Okay, and the absorber can be moving or not moving. So if it's out here, it's moving. If it's in here, it's moving. Okay, we can be looking from the perspective of the absorber or the observer, or we can be looking from the perspective of the emitter. And this is where relativity kind of messes people up because um, there's always the talk of, of the observer, you know, if, if, you know, if you're this observer or this observer, and it can get really um, complicated. But so that's why this scenario is actually easy to, uh, to map out. Okay, we're gonna map this out and we're gonna see that there is no paradox. Okay, so we've got the emitter is moving. When the emitter is moving and the, obs the observer is in the middle not moving, right? This is moving in circular motion around here. So we don't have any Doppler effect. We just have relativity. In this situation, we uh, the frequency that the observer sees is going to be the frequency that um, the uh, light source is emitting times the alpha factor, which we've already been through. Okay, so now we're going to switch places. So now the um, emitter is not moving and the observer is moving, okay? So in this case, um, the frequency that the um, that this guy the, that this guy sees is going to be the frequency this guy emits divided by the alpha factor. Um, or it, we could have uh, wonder. Well, what does the emitter see? Because the emitter is going to see uh, the reflection, let's say, of light off of the of the uh, this person here so i mean this is no different than the other two situations but i just want to put it here for the sake of completeness okay so the if this guy's in motion and this guy's in the middle this is going around this guy this guy the emitter is going to see um this guy being blue shifted and uh so this guy is going to have to use um is going to have to divide by the alpha factor. Okay. And uh, so in the final case, we have um, the emitter. Now, what we want to look at what the emitter is seeing. What, what does the emitter see? The emitter is going to see a red shift. 
Okay, the emitter, it, when the, abs the absorber is going around the circle, the emitter is going to see a red shift and the emitter is going to have to use, um, uh, is gonna have to multiply by the alpha factor. Okay, so it doesn't really matter who's on the outside side and who's on the inside. Whoever is on the inside, okay, whoever is on the inside is going to see red shift and whoever is on the outside is going to see blue shift. Right? Whoever is on the inside is going to have to multiply by the alpha factor, and whoever is on the outside is going to have to divide by the alpha factor. So there is no paradox, at least in this scenario. In this scenario, there is no paradox. There is very clear uh, who needs to calculate redshift and who needs to calculate blue shift. And so again, if you're, if you're the guy that's moving, you're going to have to um, use uh, the blue shift algorithm. And if you are not the guy that's moving, then you're going to have to use the red shift algorithm if you're looking at something in motion. So that's pretty straightforward. I think um, that clears up any possibility of a paradox, at least when you have an object in circular motion around an object that's not in circular motion. So this basically for all intents and purposes would cover um, say the GPS's that are in orbit around the earth yes there might be a little bit of a Doppler shift that needs to be accounted for and they would have to add that as an additional correction <clears throat> if the um, if the satellite is getting closer to or further away from the detector from the detector that is sitting on earth and so, um, so this scenario, uh, I think, covers nicely what we need to know in order to accommodate for uh, relativity in, uh, in the satellite GPS systems that we use uh, here on planet Earth. And so, you know, we have to worry about what does the satellite see, uh, uh, from, you know, what does the satellite see, and what do we see. And we need to coordinate the, these two um, clocks these two scenarios and so um, so that is uh, why I wanted to, to uh, talk about this very specific scenario because this is what we actually use this is what we apply um, when we uh, use uh, our GPS's okay this is what is used for GPS technology and of course Ron Hatch is the expert in this and so there's one other possibility, as I just said, uh, if the set, so because the Earth has a certain size and if, uh, <clears throat> if a detector is on one part of the Earth, it is possible that the satellite is getting further away from and closer to, um, to the detector, in which case they would also have to apply, um, they would also have to apply the Doppler shift. Okay, they would also have to apply the Doppler shift, but they, we may not be able to combine them into the C plus V and C minus V. We may have to actually apply them separately, which is why I finalized my um, specification to separate out, to separate out the uh, normal Doppler effect and the relativistic Doppler effect. Okay. So, um, and I put this one in here just to show the relationship between these two in the relativistic Doppler, Doppler effect. So um, this effect has actually been tested. Okay, there was an experiment. I did find um, an experiment uh, in a paper called Measurement of the Transverse Doppler Effect in an accelerated system so what they mean in the accelerated system what they mean is when um, uh, when you have the uh, in this case it's going to be the observer the absorber the detector in circular motion around a light source okay so in this paper they have an experimental setup which you can see right here. Let me just zoom in on that a bit. Um, and so what they have is they have an absorber. That's why I keep calling it an absorber because that's what they call it in this experiment. This is a detector. 
uh, a spectrograph, whatever you want to call it, uh, that is go that can detect a certain frequency of light. And this is a an emitter, which they call the source. It's a source. They have the emitter in the center, in the exact center of the axis of rotation. And what they do, this is a centrifuge. And what they do is they spin this, they spin this at different frequencies, and um, they do a they detect um, the frequency here. Okay, and they know what the frequency is supposed to be, and then they um, they calculate or they detect a frequency um, that this absorber receives, and they they see the the actual uh, frequency shift. And it turns out I'll leave a link to this paper. I don't really want to review this paper right now, but basically what they're saying is that um, that this uh, the absorber. Uh, the light that it received was blue shifted. Okay, it was blue shifted. It uh, just as I am showing right here, right where um, the observer that is in motion receives a blue shift. And so this has been verified with this experiment. Uh, and so um, I just thought I would point that out as I said I would earlier. And so I think that is all. I'm going to do today. Let me go back to my specifications. So, uh, like I said, I cleaned up my specification a bit. Um, I put the uh, the quantum constant next to the definition of uh, the uh, that this constant applies to, and I wrote the equation that uses that uh, quantum constant beside each one. So this is the quantum of potential. This is the quantum of kinetic and the kinetic equation, which generates a force, and the quantum of energy, where the energy quantum is um, used to calculate a, a power term. And of course, we've got the non-relativistic um, alpha factor. We have the relativistic alpha factor. And in the case of an object moving away from you or towards you, you can um, use this formula here to calculate the um, what you would see, the observed uh, frequency. And so uh, hopefully that wasn't too confusing and hopefully I didn't make any more mistakes, but if I did, it's easy to make mistakes when you do this stuff because, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of symbols, there's a lot of terms and, um, it's really hard to not make a mistake. So if I'm, I'm not afraid of making mistakes, if I make a mistake, just tell me and I will uh, make a correction. And so uh, thank you for your patience and the last mistake I made. And um, I will try to be more diligent and, and not try to make too many mistakes. Because uh, I know mistakes can, can really confuse people. I find mistakes all the time. And you know what? Because I know I can make a mistake, I, um, I'm not, I don't get too upset when I find um, I'm, I'm a mistake out there in the field. And so uh, it's easy to transcribe something incorrectly. Oh, and one point I want to make about the mistake that I did make, okay, I did not, this, I did not put this equation into my, my code, okay, I did not put the mistake into my code. What I put into my code was, was correct for the, for the relativistic Doppler effect that I was talking about in the previous video. Okay, I did not put the square root into um, into my equation. Just just to be clear. Okay, that was just a transcribing mistake. It wasn't. Um, uh, it did not affect the values that I was calculating to show that um, to, to show that these three equations are exactly the same. And so, uh, okay. I'm going to stop now. Um, I'm sure I could go on forever, but I will stop now so that this video isn't too long, and I hope you're having a great day. Ciao for now.